Hello? How is everybody? <laughs> Come on in. And let's go ahead and stand together. Maybe find someone to greet here real quick. <laughs> Are you excited to be here? <laughs> I am. <laughs> All right. Um, I just have one verse I wanted to read to us this morning. It's in Psalms 103, verse 22. It says, I will bless and praise the Lord with my whole heart. Let all his works throughout the earth, wherever his dominion stretches, let everything bless the Lord. Um, so it's a, a simple verse, but I just, Father, we just come before you to bless you with our whole heart. We don't leave anything behind, right? We bring our whole heart all of our affection everything that's happening on the inside of us we bring it we bring us to you and we decide right now this is your day this is your week this is your life i will bless you i will bless the lord with my whole heart So let's say that together. Say, I will bless the Lord with my whole heart. We will bless the Lord with our whole hearts. And Jesus, we just agree with your heart for this morning. We agree with your heart for our community. We agree with your heart for our every footstep. We agree with your heart for the earth. We say, let the earth rejoice, <laughs> right? Let the earth rejoice because you're good. That the whole earth would see him, right? And that we this morning will see the Lord. We love you. my shame and who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I met and I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I try to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day here we go and now your mercy has saved my soul And now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you You called my name You called my name darkness 
us into your glorious day. You called my name. darkness into your glorious day come on who's excited today we're going to declare what the Lord has done and what he continues to do come on but I needed rescue, my sin was heavy But chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name, here we go. I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day Hallelujah. come on we're gonna do it one more time Jesus and I needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight let's do it again I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break. I needed shelter, I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a sin. I needed shelter, I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a sin. I was broken, when I was broken, you were my healer. Now your love is the air. Again, when I was broken, when I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air. I have a fear. I have a fear. Cause when you call my name. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Thank you, Lord. Never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now.
across an ocean So I wouldn't jump You've never been closer than you are right now Cause you are a gyro You are enough Gyro You are enough And I will be content More than enough, let's do it again. Forever enough, always enough. You're more than enough. Forever enough, always enough. You're more than enough.
Cause you're more than enough You're always enough More than enough You're more than enough Always enough More than enough Forever enough Forever enough You're always enough More than enough Forever enough Always enough You're more than enough Paul had said that he learned in whatever state he is to be content. And uh, as we sing this song, I, I just, I, I want us to pray for the body. I want us to pray for the body of Christ. And I want us to just declare to the body that he is always enough. Because, you know, a lot of us, and it's understandable we're like oh I just want to get back to normal I just want to get back to the way things were I just want to get through this if we can just get over this hump if we can just break through and I you know we all get that right you know but even in the midst of hard things even in the midst of difficult circumstances he Jaira is always enough He's enough right in this. He's enough right now. So we just, Father, we, you know, we're going to just start and say, Lord, forgive us for where we've all, where, wherever we thought something other than you was enough. Wherever we've put our hope or our faith or our desire in something other than you. Whenever, wherever we have desired an outcome more than we've desired you. Wherever we have thought that an outcome or a, or, or a so-called solution was, was what we were after more than we were after you. Lord, we, we just repent. We turn from that. We turn from that right now individually and, and as, a bo as the body of Christ. And really as humanity. And Lord, we just we declare by faith to your body, the body of Christ globally. And to, and to humanity at large, to our brothers and sisters on planet Earth, we just declare and affirm by faith that Jehovah Jireh is always enough in the, whatever circumstances there, you're in. Thank you, Father. And may we be willing to let your Spirit teach us Teach us even in the midst of this. We say this to the body. Don't be a, don't get sidetracked in your in your thinking and your 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 wanting to get through that you forget to let your spirit learn. Learn Jesus in this. So we just speak empowerment. We release empowerment and encouragement. And we just say, yeah, you can learn from the Spirit of God right now in this. And like Paul, we can say, we have learned, even in these circumstances, that we can be content in the one who is our provision. Thank you, Lord. said this is a house of prayer for all nations would you guys join me in praying for India I'm feeling this has been on my heart probably the greatest crisis they've experienced in our lifetimes would you just turn your heart toward that nation if you have to pull it up on your phone so you can picture it or just bring it up in your imagination but we direct our hearts to this beautiful nation. Over a billion people. I 
I don't know if we realize this, but almost one in seven people on the planet is Indian. God, this is our family. We stretch out our faith. I felt faith rising as we sang this song. And so, Lord God, we declare the faith that it takes to say God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We speak over India right now in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be restored. Be made whole. prophesy over your land, over the physical bodies of your people. Be protected, be healed, be restored. You shall live. Come on, declare it over that nation. You shall live. You shall live. feel like Diane is playing over the nation. I see bodies all over the nation responding to the notes. Cells regenerating healthy. India, hear your song of resurrection. This is not your darkest hour. This is your brightest hour. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise and shine. For your light has come. New cases of COVID drop in Jesus' name.
I know this might sound strange for the current season that they're in, but I see children dancing and I hear the adults laughing all across the nation. India, you have a future with a hope. You have a future with a hope. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord for India. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. just like last week where we had faith to say that we will see a steep decline in violent altercations between police and the public. Father, we ask for the same thing here. We stand on that rock whose name is Jesus. He is our faith. And we say there will be that same steep decline in new cases and deaths in the nation of India, in the mighty, holy, glorious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We trust you, God. And we say thank you in advance. We say thank you in advance. By faith. Thank you, Lord.
that was sown this morning in the earth. That the whole earth would rejoice at her king. Because you're good. It's time to give. So Father, we just ask that every offering, every gift, every tithe, that it would be blessed and multiplied and that the heart that gives it would be filled and blessed and multiplied. Amen. So bring, I know a lot of you do it online, but come and give. Good morning, everyone. Um, once again, we're going to be starting having ladies' meetings. Uh, this time, we're going to try and have one in the evening. And we were going to try and start in May, but with 
<laughs> all of the COVID that went through everybody, we decided we'd bump it till June. So June 11th will be when we have our first meeting. Um, we will be having a sign-up. I think most of it will be online, but we'll hopefully have people outside a couple of weeks before we actually start. Um, it will be for... Um, we want to include the young ladies as well. So from 13 and up, um, we want to include them. We're thinking of somewhere between $15 and $20 because it's an evening meeting. Now, please, if a family is coming, talk to us because we'll work out a combined price. And if anyone is in a hard place financially, please let us know because there is always a way of helping people out um, for that. So um, it's really neat. I've there are many people here who share a heart for women's ministries, but it takes them getting together to really find out um, that we can do this again. And we want to encourage and support all women. Um, and I believe it's the time to start again. So I think I've covered everything. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, kids can go out this way. And we're excited to hear from Mark today and excited everybody that, that you're here. How y'all doing? I feel the need to just ask if there's anyone that needs prayer this morning. I wanted to do that, but we were in such a cool place in worship that I didn't want to do that. Does anybody need prayer? You can just stand up right where you are and we can pray for you. Physical healing, stuff in your family, anything. Even if you don't want to say, you just want to stand up. I just want to pray a blessing over you. Anyone? Y'all good? Okay. I'm praying anyway, because I, I think there's someone that just doesn't want to stand up. Father, I ask that you would be more apparent in this situation that I'm sensing in my heart. Heal and restore. Father, I feel like it's been like several years in this situation where they, have, they haven't seen breakthrough, they haven't seen change. They kept hoping for something to shift or break open and it hasn't yet. Lord, I ask for the love that is patient and for the faith that is secure and the trust that causes peace in that situation. But I do ask, Lord God, that you would be fully and completely yourself there. Heal, restore, save. Amen. That if you needed that or whatever or not, it's yours, free. You're, no charge. Okay. I'm going to start in 2 Kings. I'm going to be in the Old Testament for a little bit. I'm just going to give you some thoughts. In 2 Kings, I believe, I told Anderson verse 8. Is that right? Okay. This is a very familiar story, or at least for a lot of us who have grown up in the church. We, we've heard about this story before. But there's a little part at the end that I want to focus on. But I want to read the part that we 
we remember. Verse 8, now the king of Aram was warring against Israel. And he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware, do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man God had told him. Thus he warned him, so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And so he said, Go and see where he is, that I might send and take him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And now when the attendant of the man of God had risen <clears throat> and gone out early, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us, or more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And yes, that is where the movie title came from, in case you were wondering. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray. And so he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And then Elisha said to them, This is not the way. I love this. Nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he brought them to Samaria. And when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, Oh, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And so the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And then the king of Israel, when he saw them, said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? By the way, may it come a time again when kings and presidents call men of God father. I pray for that again that level of relationship, that level of love and honor. And he answered, you shall not kill them. I love that. This is the part I wanted to really bring out. Elisha answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And so he prepared a great feast for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, and he sent them away, they went to their master. I love this last line. And the marauding bands of Arameans did not come again into the land of Israel. It's, it would seem to make sense that any time and there are other places in the Bible where the Lord actually delivers the enemies of Israel into the hands of Israel and God commands, kill them all or destroy them. But in this case, I feel like I want to highlight this because it is later on in the history of the Jews where the Lord directs the man of God, Elisha, in a different direction. And I love the heart of God that we see here because we start to realize that the heart of God is not to destroy the enemy, not to defeat our enemy, not to annihilate the enemy, but to actually bless our enemy. Can I just read those verses again? I just think it's powerful, starting in 20. When they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were in Samaria. And then the king of Israel saw them and said, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? He asked it twice. You shall not. Would you kill those 
you have taken captive. Set bread and water that they may eat and drink. Father, I ask today that you would give us a heart that you gave Elisha. Because there are those who are against us. There are those who see differently than us. There are those who might consider us their enemy. And Lord, something takes place where the enemy's heart is not defeated by a sword. But something takes place in, our, in the heart of our enemy when we bless them, when we feed them, when we clothe them, when we send them safely on their journey. It says that they will not come back into the land again as an enemy. Lord, in 2021, I ask for the anointing that Elisha had on his life on ours. That there would be this, this desire that when someone comes against us, instead of fighting back with the same force that comes against us, we, it sounds completely counterintuitive, but we embrace the attacker diffusing the power and the violence. Let love reign among us, Lord. Let your anointing come and teach us the way of the Lord. I want to go to another scripture. Proverbs 25, verse 21. This is Solomon if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. How many people, when someone's angry with you, when someone's attacking you, when someone's saying evil things about you, the first thing you think about is cooking them food? Come on, let's bake them a cake. Now, we don't think about these things, but there's, some, there's wisdom in this. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. This phrasing, uh, can you go to the next verse, 22? For you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. That's a saying throughout the Bible because Jesus uses it later on. The very first time Jesus ever actually talks about the term love, you guys realize it's in the phrasing, love your enemy. That's the spirit. The very first time Jesus mentions love, it's love your enemy. And in that same uh, encouragement in Matthew chapter 6, he also tells us that it will heap burning coals on their heads. Anybody ever tried to figure out what the world heaping coals on their head means? Anybody ever wonder what it meant? Am I the only one that wondered? Okay, I'll just talk to myself here. You guys... There's two things that I found about this. One of them was, I studied this out because I want to know, what is it, are you literally like burning their head with the coals of a fire? And in Bible times, um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but in homes, they had to keep fires burning all the time because not only was it heat for their homes, but it's the only way they could cook. And, and there were times where someone's fire would go out. And then what would happen is they'd have to go to their neighbor to get coals out of their fire. And so what they would do is they would take a big cast iron pot and they would go to their neighbor's house and then the neighbor would take some of the coals that were really red hot out of their fire, put it in their cast iron pot and then this is exactly how it did. Has anybody ever been in a foreign country where they carry a pot on their head to walk? That's what happens. They actually take the pot then and I think there's some kind of, you know, cushiony thing here because I don't think you want to put a burning hot thing on your head but you actually then put it on your head and you walk back over to your house and then you put it in your stove and you get your fire going again so the idea is is that and it actually said that it was one of the greatest signs of love in bible times when you offered the burning coals from your fire because what happens to your fire when your burning coals leave the fire it could go out and it happens I burn wood fires all the time through the winter. Anybody else? Burning hot coals. Oh, baby. It just, 
Like I can feel warm right now just even thinking about it. It's the best thing. And then when you take them out, you're actually having to restoke your own fire. So one of the, one of the ways that, we, do, that we, we actually heap burning coals on their head, because it says that when the, when the person whose fire was out walked away, what were they feeling from their neighbor? They were feeling care. They were feeling love. They were feeling someone was providing for me. And they walked away. And it actually was said that in Bible times, it was one of the greatest forms of love you could offer someone by offering them the coals from your fire. Final verses I want to go to today. I don't want to take very long. Is in Romans chapter 12. I'm going to start in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Hate it. Despise it. Push it as far away from you as possible what is evil. And cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. I believe we did that today for the nation of India. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation. Keep going, even when it's hard, even when it seems to be going against you. Persevere in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. I want to tell you, in the last couple of weeks, maybe the last month, I saw that in this family as people were sick. People were saying, hey, I can't go out for you know, the 10-day quarantine period, whatever it was. I watched the family take care of one another, provide for one another. It was beautiful. Contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I'm going to read it again. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward, toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. I love that verse. If possible. First of all, it is, it is entirely possible to not be at peace with all men. I want you guys to know that. There are some people that are just going to be pissed off at you. And Paul says it right here. If possible, and by any, what does it say? As far as it depends upon you. There are going to be people that no matter what you do, they're just not going to like you. No matter what you say, they're going to pick it apart. No matter what you do, they're going to find fault in it. And as long as it depends upon you, be at peace with them. In other words, and I love this idea, is that they could call themselves an enemy of you, but you don't have to call them your enemy. And I think that's what Jesus says when he says, love your enemy, Chris. He says, decide today that they're not your enemy. Even if they hate you, even if they scoff at you, even if they pick you apart and find fault with you, it is their choice, not yours. Something takes place in your heart when someone who hates you is loved by you. There's a healing. I, I actually believe there's a healing that takes place in us. I actually, I was talking to the Lord a while back about this, back when the whole COVID thing started, because I began really asking the Lord for long life. And I, I want to tell you, I think it's something that you can ask the Lord for. And not only does he give it to you, but he'll teach you how to have a long life. Anybody else want a long life? I want a long life. I want to live long on this planet. I've said to you guys, I've told you this before. I want to see my great, great grandchildren. 
I want to see them. I want them to know me, and I want to be healthy enough to actually know them. I think there's some people that are old enough to see their great-grandchildren, but they don't actually know that they're great-great-grandchildren. I actually want to be of mind to know them. And one of the ways he said that is he's, he, he flat out showed me the scripture where Jesus says, love your enemy. Hold no bitterness, hold no wrath, hold no unforgiveness in your heart towards someone who hates you. If you can do that, I, this is what he showed me. He says, virtue will flow. That would not be available if he couldn't. Never Take your own revenge. I want to say that again. And I, I ask the spirit of those five words to saturate the defenses of every one of us. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. Now, I want you guys to make sure that you understand this, that the wrath of God is not just the punitive anger of God. Okay? It, it, we use the term wrath to just mean, I am so mad at you. But the word wrath in the New Testament means the full spectrum of God's emotional energy. It means his love and his hatred. It means his anger, his frustration, his sadness. You, you name an emotion, the word wrath covers all of that. It's the full breadth of God. What we do when we choose to not take it out on our foe, when we choose to let them go, we actually make room for the Lord to have his way with people. And I think, and remember I told you there's two uh, definitions for that heaping coals on their head. I believe this is the other one. The other one is when you heap coals on their head, well, let me just finish because it says it right here. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. What I think happens, if someone reviles us, their energy, their focus is to literally inflict harm on you. I want you to know that if someone hates you, if someone is angry with you, if someone calls you their enemy, their desire for you is pain. I want you to understand that. If someone considers themselves your enemy, they wish you harm. Now, I know that might be a harsh thing to say, but that's the reality. If you're in a fight with someone, what do they want to do to you? They want to beat you. They want to hurt you. I was watching UFC the other night for like five minutes. I, I can't watch UFC for very long. I, I can't stand watching another human being be hit. I just can't do it. It's like I, I can watch it for about five minutes and I have to stop because it's just like, I'm, again, for some people you love to watch UFC. You could watch it all night. You probably pay the pay-per-view prices for all that kind of stuff. I can't handle it. I can't stand watching a man's fist change the form of another man's face. Do you ever watch it in slow motion? It's awful. Like, like this, you see how ugly that is? It's way worse when the punch is coming out of 100 miles an hour. But that's what an enemy is. And so what happens is when you step back and you make room for the Lord, first of all, the swing can't reach. This is really important. The swing can't reach you. And then as a result, they're swinging and it's not reaching and so eventually they stop swinging. It doesn't mean that their heart doesn't want to continue to do harm, but they realize that it's empty. It's not working. Don't forget, what I'm talking about is heaping burning coals on their head. I think what takes place is we back up because here's what I think happens. When we engage in a fight and we give them our face, but we also give them our fist. What we're doing, I actually believe that we're distracting them from the wrath of God. Because they are focused on our wrath. 
When they see us as the enemy and they see us engage them in the fight, the, the focus now is on the person in front of them. But if we back up and we give room for the Lord to have his way, now they begin to feel a different kind of emotional spectrum than our tangling with them. You guys with me? As I back up, I give room to the Lord Jesus. This is what Paul is teaching us here. He says, look, don't take your own revenge. When you see someone punch you, when someone says something with you, the best thing you can do is not retaliate. This is what I think Jesus is talking about when he says, turn the other cheek. When he says, give them your cloak also. You guys know those scriptures. How many people don't like those scriptures? I don't like it because I don't like being stolen from. I, one hits enough, why another? But this is what he's talking about. He says, back up. Let me at my child. What too many of us are doing when we engage in the conflict, when we engage in the fight, especially in the spirit. I think there's a way to engage somebody without joining in the spirit of an enemy. I believe you can engage someone in conflict as a friend, though they might see themselves as an enemy. The problem is oftentimes when someone fights with you, right away you want to fight, right? Jimmy, come here. My friend Jimmy. Everybody say hi, Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy loves being in front of people. Okay. <laughs> Just put your hands up like this. Anybody notice something that he did? He did not push back. When I pushed him, do it again. Most of you, if I were to do that, push against me. Almost every time I ever do that with somebody, they push against me. That's why I picked Jimmy. Because I knew Jimmy wouldn't. I love you, dude. You're my hero. Go sit down. Most people, when they're pushed against, what do you do? Push back. You push back. You know you do it. You don't want to admit you do it because you're in church, but you do it. Even if you don't do it verbally, even if you don't do it out loud, inside you're going, <laughs> anybody? The people that choose not to push back when someone pushes against them. What you'd, first of all, you're letting healing virtue rise up on the inside of you instead of angry, vitriolic. There's all kinds of really bad words that go along with that. And it literally releases, oh, what's that word? Help me out, medical people. Cortisol. Anybody ever heard of cortisol? You know, it's one of the quickest aging hormones in your body. When you... When cortisol gets released in your body, every cell experiences cortisol and it immediately begins to age to the point where cell death happens faster in the life of those who release more cortisol than others. So here's the question. What are the situations that release cortisol? Stress, conflict are the two biggest ones. If you have a lot of stress in your life or if you're involved in a lot of conflict, drama, those kinds of things in your life, you release cortisol, cell death happens quicker. Cell death is how aging takes place. When I pushed against Jimmy, like, I don't know if you know, he just went, K -k 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 -k. Like, like, I don't know if you knew what you were doing or not, but he was literally not engaging me. There is a lesser known... Um, it's not even really considered a martial art. You know, like Kung Fu. What are some other martial arts? Jiu Jitsu. What? Krav, blah, 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 Maga, something like that. Something like, I forget how to say that. Huh? Taekwondo. How many have you heard of Aikido? Okay, it's not one of the first four or five that pop up on people's minds. And the reason why is because Aikido's main role, main spirit, like the spirit of Aikido is to end the fight. Its main goal is to produce harmony between the two people that are engaged in the conflict. So what takes place in Aikido is when someone attacks, I'm actually taking their momentum in and I'm literally embracing it. This sounds strange, but you take that angry momentum coming at you and you embrace them as a friend and you diffuse the violent spirit that's coming against you. Go look this up. It's really powerful. You actually, in Aikido... What you do is you actually see that person as your friend and your physical movement toward them or, or at them is to make them your friend.
to create harmony between the two of you. Now, I think most of us would say that in a conflict, that's not usually the goal that you have. Usually it's, I'm right. But in Aikido, it's like, come here, come here, come here. You're more important than me being right. And I find in, in conflict, I find in enemy combatant type situations that if we can decide that that other person is so incredibly valuable that I would never want to hurt them. I would never want to injure them, even though their spirit coming against me is to injure me. If the heart that I have is to say, that's my friend and I love you, what we do even though we might be engaging them, we're engaging them from a completely different spirit and we're leaving room for the Lord. And in that, and I've, I've had this happen to me. Man, when I was, I'll just say it, when I was younger, I liked to fight. Like I actually looked for opportunities. I know you probably don't think that about me, but I liked to fight. In fact, one of my favorite things to do in high school was to find the bully and fight them. I did, I used to do it. I could tell you a story, but I don't wanna go long. I'm going long anyway. I always say that. And so I used to love to find the person that was like making other people feel small and all that kind of stuff. And I realized now that when I did that, I was actually only making the bully more of a bully. I was feeding the spirit that they were working in. And now I realize that my heart's desire is to diffuse the spirit of a bully to diffuse the spirit of an enemy. And Paul uses the same verses from Proverbs that we just saw in Proverbs 25. Vengeance is his, is the Lord's, and I will take care of this. If your enemy is hungry, you feed him. And as they're eating the food that their enemy made for them, suddenly the wrath of God can be felt. But if I'm busy beating them up, if I'm busy tangling in warfare with them, they can't feel the Lord's wrath. They're too busy engaging my revenge from their latest action toward me, and they can't feel the Lord. I do not want to be a distraction for someone's interaction with the Lord. And neither do you. Our goal should be that we facilitate ongoing and consistent encounters with Jesus. And sometimes that means someone who's coming against us, hey, 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 come here, come here, come here. Like when someone says, I hate you, and you say, I love you. Like, I know that's a really hard thing to say. Or someone, someone says or does something really terrible to you and you have every right in the world to hold on to the pain, to hold on to the offense, to hold on to what, the anger, whatever it is, and you say the words, I forgive you and I let you go. Something takes place in the heart of your enemy that could never happen when you held it against them. I've talked about this before. I fully and completely believe that if I hold unforgiveness in my heart toward a human being, they experience it. I've heard it said all the time, oh no, the only person that unforgiveness hurts is the person who holds it. I don't believe that. We are way more connected than that. I believe if I talk about you in my bedroom, it somehow works its way out into the spirit and it affects you. Because I don't think the space that exists like between geographically between Texas and New York is like a thousand miles or 1500 miles. That doesn't exist in the spirit. There's no distance geographically in the spirit. So I could be miles and miles away from you, but if I think negative thoughts about you, if I judge you wrongly, if I think about you in a way that God doesn't think about you, I believe that negatively impacts you. I believe we're that connected because we are the body of Christ. We are the family of God. This corporate man is the revelation of God on the earth. Why wouldn't our, if my love impacts you, I guarantee you my judgment does too. And so I want to engage you from that spirit. And when I engage you in a spirit of love, when I engage you in a spirit of forgiveness, when I decide that vengeance is not the way, I leave room for the Lord to work not only in that person's heart, but in mine too. 
Because don't forget, there's another person that's distracted in the conflict when I fight, and it's me. <laughs> in fact, if I engage in the same spirit that's coming against me, I am, I am not in the spirit of the Lord. I'll just say that. And the results are, is I am just as distracted as the person that's trying to fight me. Here's the verse I've been trying to get to. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That word overcome means defeated, conquered, and overwhelmed by. Okay? You know, even beyond the relational context that I've been using mostly as the example here, the idea of <clears throat> enemies and evil is something that I'm, I'm seeing a lot in the world today. Like there, I, more, more than ever in my lifetime, is there polarization? Is there sides being taken? Is there, this is my view and this is their view, and as a result, we are against one another? Like it seems to be a cultural like norm now to be against or in disagreement with somebody as the result of what they believe or what they think. And as a result, what I see taking place, and I see a lot of Christians doing this, and I think we've talked about this before, but I want to reiterate it, is that as a result of something that we see wrong in the world or in the government or in business or in whatever, we, we focus on the evil. We focus on what we think is wrong. And when we do that, like, and guys, this is, so, this is the exact same example, but just on a much broader sense. We engage in a conflict that God actually doesn't want us in. The responsibility of the believer is not to point out what is wrong in the world. The responsibility of the believer is to demonstrate and model what is beautiful in the world. What is right, what is holy, what is true. Our existence exists like you exist to be light you exist to be glory you exist to shine and you can like your life without verbally saying it should say look at the lord but every time we say hey do you see what's going on over there do you see what's happening over there to the point that's why I love the story. Elisha blinds them. Like, I think there needs to be a blinding that takes place so that we can simply see what the Lord is doing. His servant was so caught up in all of the army that was all around him. And Elisha says, dude, can't you see? Can't you see what's really available? What's really going on? Lord, open his eyes. I'm going to tell you, I pray that for the church. May your eyes be opened so that you would not be overwhelmed by evil. When I engage in what is wrong in the world, I highlight it. When I step back from what is wrong, look, there's a lot of bad stuff happening. I think there's a lot of plots. I think there's a lot of evil being talked about in dark corners that affects the masses. Guys, you don't defeat it by pointing it out and screaming about it. You defeat it by walking in a different spirit that does not engage the evil. I engage my father's spirit. And when I engage my father's spirit, I'm no longer overcome by what's going on in that little dark corner over there. Instead, I am overwhelmed. I am conquered by good. And I begin to walk in that goodness. I begin to engage in that goodness. And my life extends it into the earth. That's why we exist. Whatever we engage in, we're overwhelmed by. Whatever, whatever you point your energy toward, whatever you think is, like whatever you give your heart to, whatever you give your influence to, that's what takes over in your life. This is what Paul is talking about here. He says, at the end of the day, do not be overcome by evil. And look, there's a lot to be overcome by. There's a lot to be conquered by. And my fear is, is that those who are the light of the world feel like it's a much more important responsibility to go fight with evil. And I would say to you, please, you are free from that responsibility today. Because Jesus already defeated every devil. I want to say that again. The victory that Jesus won on the cross is final and complete, and he does not need your help. 
Come on. The spirit of fight can leave you and it's going to be okay. How else do I need to say this? You do not have enemies in the world to fight. You have brothers and sisters to love. You do not have powers and principalities to pull down. No, I, I, oh, I, I want to teach on spiritual warfare again because it has ruined the minds and hearts of charismatic Christians. If we walk according to the Spirit of God and move forward according to the purpose and calling for which we were called, there will literally be a diffusing of every enemy tactic, every enemy plan that exists. It is a trap of those dark forces to actually entice you into the fight. Come over here. Come here. You want to... Yeah. Come over here. I want to show you what we're doing over here. And then we go, oh, the Lord is showing us what evil is doing. Guys, there are a lot of Christians who believe the Lord is showing you. No, can I tell you, the Lord will not want to show you what's going on evil. He wants to show you what beauty is happening in the earth. You will know what spirit is at work in you by what the spirit shows you. Look at Elisha. Elisha was not looking at the enemy that was surrounding him. His eyes were focused on who was for him. You will know what spirit is at work by what that spirit shows you. When you see light, when you see glory, when you see goodness, when you see hope, you know spirit of God is involved. When you see evil schemes and you see evil plans and you hear stories of strategies to destroy nations, you will know that that spirit that's authoring because he's, beg he's uh, what's the word? Uh, baiting you into a fight that you were never meant to be a part of because Jesus already defeated it. Instead, those who are more than conquerors continually focus on what good can be done in the earth. What's possible we are overwhelmed by good. We're overwhelmed by hope. We're overwhelmed in faith. No matter what personal situation or global situation that exists, you can be overwhelmed by the hopeful possibilities that exist within them. And that is light. And then every enemy becomes a friend. Even those who plot evil right now, even those who hate me right now for speaking or for being whoever I am, I can love them and I, I highlight the possibility of full and complete reconciliation. But if I fight them, I put off the date to reconciliation. If I engage them in that, oh, you know what I'm saying, I'm done. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead would bring life into our mortal bodies. That we would see according to the spirit. That we would trust that evil cannot win because all authority in heaven and earth belongs to Jesus. So why would we fret? Why would we fight? And why would we worry when we can trust and we can be a part of solution-oriented action? Holy Spirit, would you anoint us? Holy Spirit, would you wash us? Holy Spirit, would you diffuse the desire to fight with enemies when we're supposed to be cooking them a meal? I ask, Lord, that your wrath has room. Thank you, Lord. We give you room today. We give you room in our relational conflicts. We give you room in our national issues. We give you room. We back up from engaging devils that are already defeated. And we give room to you to work in the lives of those who are influenced by them. Let those heaping coals cause them to experience your heart. Awaken every heart through this love we have for them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Hey, guys, did you guys, you know, I want you all to look at the time. Just look at the time. Look at the time right now. You're welcome. Did you want to say something, Jeff? Absolutely. Matthew 16. Absolutely right. It's almost an exact confirmation. Yep. We can choose to bind what we want to bind. We can choose to loose what we want to loose. Fix your eyes on that which is good and loose love, loose power, loose faith and hope. Amen. Can I ask a question? Yeah. How would you respond to somebody who, who called you naive to be that full of hope, goodness, focus on love, focus on like how, like if they, if that was your response and they were like, like that's just naive or you're unaware of what's really happening or like how, how would your response be? How would my response be if I'm called naive? Because I have been. Because <laughs> I have been. Because well, I have responded to things with a, almost like the opposite spirit. Uh -huh. and it's kind of like I'm dismissed for being mm -hmm. just, you know, naive. Yeah. I don't live by the reputation other people have of me, first of all. So if other people think I'm naive, that's their... That doesn't determine my identity. Just ignore them. Well, I don't just ignore them because I want to engage them as love, as my friend. But I won't let their reputation about me determine my identity. Well, I, so yes, but like it almost feels like I suddenly have no weight then. Like my hopefulness, my choice to be focused on the good has no then because I'm just naive. So I don't have any impact. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? With that person. Yeah, with that person. Doesn't matter. That's okay. It just has to be okay. There's so many other people that need the love, the hope, the light that you are. They hear enough people talking about all the bad stuff that's going on. They need someone like you. There's other people that need someone like you. Yeah. If someone calls me naive or someone calls me, oh, you don't really get it, Mark. I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Innocent as doves. Well, most people choose one or the other. There's a way to be both. In fact, I'm, I've wrote about this before, that I believe our wisdom is influenced by our ability to be innocent. The degree to which I am innocent is the degree which I walk in wisdom. One of the problems is people that call you naive think they're wise. Right, because they're, they think yeah. that it's wise to be aware of Absolutely. That wisdom is actually not at all that. Jesus said, oh, you've hidden these things from the wise of the world and you've shown them to children. Children are innocent. The beauty is we get to see what the Spirit's actually saying and doing in the earth because we maintain our innocence. Call me naive all you want. The Lord calls me innocent. And as a result of my innocence, I have true wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God, not wisdom that comes from the Spirit of this world. There's a lot of people who think they're wise because they know stuff. And that's the kind of people that think they're wise in their own eyes, but the Spirit's wisdom is not available. So I actually think it's a little bit of a badge of honor for someone to call me naive because I believe that innocence is what uh, makes me open to the Spirit's wisdom. Yeah. It's a good question, though. Stay in your innocence. True wisdom comes from it. Love you guys. Have a great week.